Thanks, Heinz. Uh, again, my name is John Griffin. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Numerit Incorporated, a startup company located in San Francisco, California. Uh, my background is also in chemistry and drug discovery. I'm actually pleased to have uh, known Heinz for more than 30 years uh, when he arrived at Caltech to be a postdoc in Peter Durbin's laboratory where I was uh, working on my uh, PhD. From Caltech, I went to do a postdoc at Harvard Medical School in the laboratory of Chris Walsh. And that was a time when Chris was just beginning to work on the mechanism of vancomycin resistance, uh, which was very interesting work spearheaded by Tim Bug. And I, I fell in love with vancomycin as a molecule. And so when I finished at Harvard and moved uh, to Stanford to start my own laboratory, I actually worked on vancomycin and bacitracin as what I consider the receptor-like antibacterial agents, just to understand their synthetic and semi-synthetic chemistry and how they might be modified in ways to improve their properties, but also to teach us some more things about uh, antibacterial function. Uh, among the things we discovered from my laboratory was that dimers, covalently linked dimers of vancomycin, were active against vancomycin-resistant enterococci, and that came out of a collaboration, uh, a very productive collaboration with the microbiologist at Eli Lilly, Thalianikas, who many of you may know. Um, and so that discovery also brought me into contact with a group of people who were starting a company to exploit principles of multivalency and drug design. And that idea eventually became the company or companies we now know as TheraVance. And I joined TheraVance as Chief Scientific Officer and left Stanford at that time. But for the past now more than a decade, I've actually worked with a very different set of people with expertise in machine learning and computer science and software engineering to apply these emerging techniques of artificial intelligence in drug discovery in order to produce a more hopefully predictive but also more efficient process by which we can discover and design small molecule drugs. And that's the topic that I'm going to address with you here today. Yes, I need to pull up my... This one? this one, yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Obrigado. Yes, and so I think, you know, we're all becoming aware of the, of the promise that artificial intelligence has in the field of healthcare uh, to improve patient experiences and outcomes. Uh, I think, you know, certainly natural language processing has contributed to our ability to watch the trafficking on the Internet to understand perhaps where influenza outbreaks are beginning. Uh, I also know small companies who are applying just ways of monitoring uh, vital signs and other very simple kinds of information coming from instrumented patients, say in an ICU setting, in order to be able to predict which of those patients will uh, become septic, okay, and so that one can intervene with them prior to actually having to deal with a patient who has developed sepsis, you can in fact prevent it. So there are many aspects of this that are ongoing now. It's a really a burgeoning field. Uh, but I have to say from Numerit's perspective, we've been at this, as I said, for more than a decade. For much of that period of time, this has been rather a lonely <laughs> endeavor, often as in a somewhat hostile environment. But just, I would say, in the last year or so, uh, a lot of emphasis has been put on the, uh, the, op the opportunities in applying artificial intelligence in healthcare, such that more than 100 small companies and start other startups have uh, initiated work to actually uh, actually uh, leverage what they can learn from big data and cloud computing and artificial intelligence in order to uh, improve processes in healthcare. Uh, probably uh, at almost the same rate of growth has actually been the growth in specific scientific conferences uh, really devoted to AI and healthcare. And so from the things that splash on, into your computer screen every day or that come across your desk, it's like just the, you know, the buzzwords uh, that one is beginning to hear. Uh, it actually tells you that how much I think interest there is around uh, this field. Uh, but I think what's important and really promising 
is that this, this movement has also brought people with very different skill sets and, and intellectual perspectives into proximity and even within you know, our field uh, where you know, traditional predictors have been physicians and chemists and biologists. And that, I think, makes for very exciting kinds of interactions to bring new tools to bear on the processes uh, very, that are very difficult processes of drug discovery and development, you know, as both uh, Andrea and Heinz have alluded to earlier today. So, but really what these new perspectives are, I, I would say is there's really an increased emphasis on predictivity rather than explanatory power. So the data scientists and the physicists who are coming into this field, it's not intrinsic to them or uh, intuitive to them that we're trying to explain phenomena in the way a small molecule may bind to a protein, for example. Really what they want to understand is how best to predict an accurate result that is then of value to someone, to their company or to a patient. So you think in, in, in general sense how early applications of genomics where we could use uh, the, the identification of single nucleotide polymorphisms as actually predictors of disease. But just as important, I would say, in that endeavor scientifically uh, has, has been the use of those connections to say actually these SNPs explain a defect in a protein okay, that in fact lies at the basis of this disease. So it's an explanatory piece. And in, in terms of medicinal chemistry, we can use docking experiments to predict the activity of compounds against a protein target. But just as important, I think, in that endeavor has been the fact that we're really understanding basic uh, facts about binding of those compounds through, through docking experience. So really explaining the process by which this molecule is bound or binds with a certain affinity as much as that. But I think a lot of that is being thrown out, not thrown out the window, but it's really being uh, superseded by these just, well, just try to be predictive, okay, because that's a useful outcome. So I don't know how many of you are aware, about a year ago, Human Genome Sciences in San Diego uh, published a study where they actually took genomic and other omics data from one of their employees, and they used that data alone to predict that person's face. Okay, in fact, this is the, the actual image shown here, and in fact, they were it's a quite an accurate prediction. Uh, the one thing, though, they say that they had not been able to predict was that this man chose to grow a beard. So they had to actually install that on him uh, when they went to publish the paper. Okay, so that's a remarkable thing. When they're not trying to explain why his face is this way at all, they're just trying to predict what he's going to look like. And I think the holy grail for us then, in terms of small molecule drug design, would be to predict as many of the properties that lead to drug success and failure okay, at the early stages of drug design and optimization, so that in fact we need to make fewer compounds through fewer cycles of optimization and with fewer rates of downstream attrition uh, uh, as we go into and through development. So I'd state this as a goal, not where we are today, because I'm certainly not saying that we're ready to have a computer print a structure on a cocktail napkin that we can send to Janet Woodcock and ask for approval of our therapeutic product. Okay, but it just emphasizes the fact that being predictive is very valuable and there's so much information behind these predictions being made now, it may be very difficult, in fact, to actually describe and explain how that prediction has been made. So really, this, this, these fields, really at their basis, they rely on this, again, an emerging field of machine learning. And machine learning really sits at the core of artificial intelligence and data science. And as a, as a discipline, it really kind of came about in a kind of a theoretical and academic sense with the hypothesis that if we, if we can make and understand how a machine like a computer can learn, we may then in turn understand something better about how humans think or about how the brain works. And so that was the kind of academic underpinning of this field. But more recently, in a practical sense, the people who are beginning to work with the large amounts of data that are being very important data, like, uh, like text and pictures of cats that can be found on the internet, say there's just too many of the, this data for us to go through and in a forward sense try to write a computer program that will predict 
how to, you know, how language can be processed or how a cat or another animal may be recognized from an image. Okay, rather, if we can find ways to teach the computer to learn how to solve these problems for itself, in fact, that's a much more, it's a much more efficient way to do it. It also allows you to take advantage of more of that data because the computer is very good about crunching through all of that information and utilizing in the building of a model that it can apply in a forward sense. So really, in the end, that's what machine learning is. It's actually computers apply algorithms uh, to training data of some kind in order to derive a function, a mathematical function or another computer program that can then be applied to new data, okay, in order to make a useful prediction of some kind. And much of the, the work in this field and the machine learning that goes on relevant to drug discovery is at this point what we would call supervised learning, okay, where the training data is a set of, say, compounds with a label. Is that compound active or is it permeable uh, to a cell? And so using this as a training set, then we apply algorithms to derive a function that can be applied to new spaces of chemistry in order to make a useful prediction of how that compound is going to behave, say, in a particular assay. Now that's, of course, as uh, Heinz and Andrea were alluding to, those kinds of predictions can be very useful. So machine learning is obviously ubiquitous in its use. Uh, you know, one of the simplest examples, you know, you find in your calculator and graph pad or in the, the mathematical tools associated with your databases is, you know, just forming a linear regression. And so the goal of a linear regression is to take a set of data, here shown as the green uh, data points, and to minimize uh, the mean squared error cost function shown here on the, the left-hand side of the slide. Uh, and the technique that's typically used for that is a gradient descent algorithm uh, where you have the learning parameter alpha uh, and you actually go about, it's a, a step of learning, and you then apply the algorithm to actually minimize the error between your predicted uh, regression line and the data points, the mean squared error. Okay, and so that's you know, something that we do and it's useful all the time, but then the problem comes in when in fact, of course, your calculator or graph pad or your database offers you the chance to use higher order polynomials in fitting this data that you have. And so the temptation is always to say, when there's noise in the data, is to say, well, in fact, I can fit this data better if I allow my, my program to choose a higher order polynomial in the fitting. Okay, because this now, look, I really can fit this data a lot better, but the problem with that is then you are actually working to minimize the approximation error, which is your ability to fit the data on which you've trained, but really what you want to do is you want to have a predictive function that's good, that has a minimal of its estimation error, which is its ability to accurately, accurately predict new information. Okay, and so this is a classic example of overfitting, and I have to say it really has bedeviled the field of, of computational chemistry for decades. Okay, you're trying to fit to your training data when in fact your goal is to get a function that's useful to predict something in spaces it has not yet seen. So uh, the Numeret as a company, we have, have built a platform that's based on ligand-based modeling of drug activities and other properties that can be applied to drug discovery. And by ligand-based modeling, what I mean is, is that the AI we use are algorithms that learn from data obtained from biological assays, where the training data are structures of compounds, like the fluoroquinolone shown here on the left-hand side of the slides. Uh, rather than uh, structure-based design, where you have the, you know, a three-dimensional, typically high-resolution structure of the protein target of interest. You may have the co-crystal structures, as Heinz was describing earlier, uh, and you're trying to dock new compounds against it in order to decide which one is likely to bind better. Uh, the, one of the advantages, or many of the advantages, of ligand-based design is it's intrinsically more general than a structured-based design approach. Because by having training data of the type you get from biological assays, you can apply this approach to many more kinds of phenomena. Your on-target activity that's of interest to you, uh, selectivity against off-targets, uh, properties like membrane permeability, whole cell activities. In fact, you don't have to have the structure of the target. In fact, you don't even need to know what the target is. You just need some tra training data of the form of chemical structure and a label, okay? When you are applying this kind of approach, there are really two main tasks that you have. Uh, first, you have to represent that data that you're going to train on in a way that a computer can understand. 
And then you have to apply an appropriate machine learning algorithm to extract out the function uh, that you can then use in a going forward sense. Uh, and that's shown on the right-hand side. This is then a statistical model, machine learning model, that actually discriminates things on the red, the red side from the gray side, for example. And there are a number of challenges that must be addressed here uh, if you're going to do this with high accuracy and with good efficiency. Uh, the first is, you know, what kind of representation of, you know, small molecule space actually, actually captures that in a way that that's useful to a computer but also reflects the reality of a small molecule interacting with biological targets or other milieu. And so, for example, we have found that using uh, a, a four-point pharmacophore representation, which captures all the ways in which a small molecule can display its chemical functionality in three dimensions as a way of looking to see which protein targets, for example, it may be able to interact with. That information of four-point pharmacophore, shown in the central panel here, actually can be expressed as a bit key, and that's this the line of the, the orange and the gray dots to below, okay? And so that's a, that's a representation that a computer can understand and then can apply machine learning techniques that look at the bit keys for compounds that are active versus inactive, or maybe more active versus less active, in order to extract out a, 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 a complex model that actually can be then used to predict these properties in new compounds that are not part of the training set. So one of the issues here is that to properly capture small molecule space, you need a bit key that has approximately 10 million different four-point pharmacophores in it. Okay, so that's a very complex representation. And uh, st classical statistics would tell you that you typically need as many training data as you have degrees of freedom in your representation. Okay, if I just told you that 10 million degrees of freedom, you, there are really no program we have for which we have 10 million data points. In fact, I'm going to show you later, 10 million data points is about the total number of data points that's available in the published literature covering all of medicinal chemistry so far. Okay, but it turns out that there are a whole uh, set of recently developed machine learning algorithms where the dependence, if there are certain requirements are met in terms of the sparsity of the representation being populated, that in fact the requirement for data is not the number of the data, the number of degrees of freedom, it's more the logarithm of the degrees of freedom. And then this brings this problem into the realm of tractability for modern machine learning. The other the problems here uh, relate to the work that we as chemists and biologists have done because uh, biology is intrinsically noisy. Okay, and again, this problem of odor ver fitting that relates to trying to fit the noise of in your assay, the noise of your data, rather than the actual signal. The other is the, the data that we have is, uh, is mostly positive data. It's very biased. What's in the literature are what chemists chose to make, were able to make, decided to publish on, were asked to write a patent on. Okay, and that it's out there. We typically don't publish a lot of negative information, and Heinz was speaking to this uh, in the last talk, but yet that's very important data for a machine to use in order to build a useful model. And then there's finally, again, this whole notion of, of uh, overfitting, you know, really fitting to your training data, not think about the longer term goal. But if you're able to go through and actually solve a lot of the address and solve a lot of these issues, then you can build a platform for small molecule drug design that's based on ligand-based modeling. So that uh, you can take data for your target or biological effect of interest, and you can apply a machine learning algorithm. We found really, we've done a lot of research that algorithms based on multidimensional boosting are very effective in producing models uh, for small molecule properties. Then this model that's present in the center of the slide then could be used to screen in silico libraries of compounds of different kinds. And this is a lot of interesting uh, movement in this field as well. So uh, compound suppliers currently offer approximately 20 million compounds that are supposedly available off the shelf. So that's quite a few compounds. But also companies like Enamine, which is located in the Ukraine, actually have, they understand their chemistry space and their ability to produce compounds with their libraries of reagents well enough that they can predict with high accuracy that they can produce more than one billion small molecules in a particular library that they can provide to you. And so those things, you can actually, we've shown this, you can get those in just a few weeks uh, and for not a very high price. And so that's what brings into play 
a very interesting new uh, set of diversity in compound space. And then finally, for each and every project that we run internally, we will define uh, chemical libraries in a combinatorial sense that we think have solutions, not for just general chemistry space like these other two sources I described, uh, but actually for this specific problem, say for a new antibiotic or for a new antihypertensive drug or a new antiarrhythmic drug. We design the chemistry spaces there that can be searched with the models of interest. And so the outcome of that is by searching then through these large spaces with these predictive models, then we can prioritize compounds to either buy or to make and, and test. And the goal being that is we can reduce the number of compounds that need to be actually studied in the laboratory from in the, you know, on the order of millions for a high throughput screen to the order of hundreds. And in a lead identification stage, okay, we can design and make hundreds of compounds, maybe not thousands. And in lead optimization, again, for you know, a reduction still. Okay, so if it's smaller number of cycles, smaller numbers of compounds, greater predictive, predictivity and success in being able to advance a program. Okay, but as we've heard from the previous talks today, the drug design is obviously a multi-parameter optimization. So rather than just activity against a particular target, I'm recapitulating one of Heinz's slides here. Well, because in fact, if we're thinking about gram-negative organisms, you are going to have to deal with this bouncer par excellence of the microbial world, which are these tripartite drug resistance pumps. Okay, and it's understanding can you predict which compounds uh, are likely to be and not be you know, good substrates for that, because being able to enter into and persist inside bacterial cells, especially if your target of course, is in the cytoplasm, as Heinz was describing, is really key to the ability to have an effect against a gram-negative organism. And so that, in thinking about a, the platform that would be applied to an antibiotic design, well, then one can uh, extract the data that is relevant. Okay, what are, is there biochemical or biophysical data for interaction of small molecules with the target of interest? Uh, there is all this very useful susceptibility data, which is completely useless in the context of typically of a structure-based design program, but is very relevant for ligand-based design program, there's susceptibility data. There may be information about which compounds are cytostatic versus bactericidal. Uh, there may be a little bit of information about you know, specific activities in efflux assays. And so then this data can then be used as training data in order to build the relevant predictive models. I'm showing you five here which may span models for target binding and functional activity, uh, susceptibility against a number of different bacterial strains for the ability to pass through the porins and the uh, cytoplasmic membrane and to whether or not they may be uh, um, uh, substrates for the efflux pumps. And so then those are the predictive models. Now, in addition to or instead of the spaces of chemistry I described on the previous slide, of course, here one should go look where one can find success. And as high, this is a, taken from Heinz's slide today, that in fact one would look at this antibiotic chemical, this property space of antibiotics, in order to populate that space virtually and search through it, so that in fact one doesn't necessarily have to build you know, physical libraries of this antibiotic friendly space, one can actually predict which of those compounds, may, you can build them in a in virtual sense, but then you can screen them virtually so that you have to make smaller numbers of them in the laboratory, okay? And so this is a scheme for uh, such a, a, a program and a platform for say gram negative drug design. But I'm going to, the, this practical example I'm going to get to requires uh, me to explain how there are other ways in which one can use predictive models uh, in, in different ways based on your ability to make accurate predictions. So uh, the, as I said earlier, the published medicinal chemistry information kind of comprises now approximately 10 million data points. And so the thing to say there is that our data copia, if you will, is not big data, it's not even close to big data, okay? It's small to medium data for any given project. And so you may be aware that, you know, the people are applying very interesting um, algorithms that come from multi-layer uh, neural networks, uh, deep learning. Uh, deep learning is typically very data hungry in order to use the, the 
the AI not only to make to build a predictive model, but also to extract out the relevant representations. It's a very powerful approach. I think for most of the problems we're facing right now in drug design, there is really not sufficient data to allow us to do that, uh, to use that well. There are some modifications that may be useful. But anyhow, I just wanted to make that point so you understand kind of where we are in data space. Uh, but we, we've taken all of this published data and we've used it to build thousands of different predictive models for small molecule properties. Uh, you know, interaction with thousand different targets, the functional uh, impact on those targets, other things, re, you know, physical chemical properties, membrane permeabilities, etc. Uh, but if you focus on using the thousand or six thousand or so of those models that really speak just to uh, binding to targets or functional modulation of those targets, then you can kind of run this process in reverse, that you can take an, a single small molecule and you can predict its activity across this panel of models. And what you do, which is really, is it said, okay, well this molecule is likely okay, to interact with or modulate this set of targets. So it's one way to predict off targets for a compound that you may be considering putting into development. It also could be used to say, well, in fact, this drug may be repurposed for some other use because of the fact that we've been able to identify a previously unknown target of its action. So this structure, this is just a random structure that I drew uh, to in making my slides. I did run it through the system, and these are the actual predictions for that compound. We have not tested them in the laboratory, but this is a very clear hypothesis, okay, of molecular activities that can actually be then tested in the laboratory. So rather than compounds that are predicted to have a certain activity, these are now targets that are, that are predicted to be um, in, impacted by this particular small molecule. And then this led my colleagues, uh, you know, who are the, the data scientists and the machine learning experts, uh, to, to form another hypothesis. And that's this, this concept of, of metamodeling. Which is, okay, we have this panel, in this case, let's say, let's take 800 of these predictive models for different targets. Okay, is it possible to actually use the fingerprint of the predicted activity across that set of targets for a set of, you know, therapeutic agents, in this case antibiotics, to produce a, as a representation that can then be used uh, as the input for applying machine learning techniques, again, boosting techniques, to form what is called a meta model. Okay, and the idea here is, is there something about the fingerprints across this large panel of predictive models that actually can capture kind of more complex phenomena? For example, activity in a cellular assay, that is typically what we're looking at in antibacterial discovery. Okay, and so that's the question there we wanted to ask. And so we performed this experiment with, uh, with, in, with the system, and the, the initial, uh, the, the initial report was, in fact, yes, this could be a, a successful approach because what this panel in the uh, upper right-hand part of the slide is saying is if you take these 800 models and you take one of the models out and you rebuild, the, okay, and then you take the, the compounds that were in the training set for those models, okay, for that particular model, and you run it, okay, then you, then, what you, then you run it again, what you find is that that loss that you get in building the model without that training set is not much worse than when it was in there, which means that the remaining basis set of 799 models actually is a useful, provides useful representation for building the model on top of that. So with this encouragement then, we undertook a couple of experiments in a prospective validation of this system. Uh, so then we could then take these models and we could then screen the chemical libraries I described to you earlier uh, in order to predict some compounds that we should buy and test. So uh, with, uh, we tested this with a couple different bacterial organisms, first being uh, M. tuberculosis. Uh, the training data we had here, just kind of raw extraction from our database, were 231 compounds that had been described as having activity against MTB at less than 12 and a half micrograms per mil. And there were 5,000 plus compounds that identified as being inactive against TB. So the, I'm showing you at the bottom of the slide representatives for the different classes of compounds that are found among the actives here. So they, you know, they represent the usual suspects, the known active compounds against TB. And as I described to you earlier, the training models we used as that basis set uh, were 800 different models. 
And so uh, we then built that model with that training data from TB. Uh, we used it to screen a commercial library of 3,000 commercially available compounds. Uh, from the top 100 performing compounds against that model, we were able to, uh, we were actually able to get 41 of them, and we sent them for testing against uh, MTB strain H37RV. And we saw with a very high rate of success, and this is you know, the validation of the predictive accuracy of this approach, is 17 of these 41 compounds were in fact active at 6.25 micrograms per mil. And that's not a very high concentration. Uh, and they showed greater than 50% growth inhibition. And six of the compounds that I'm showing you here on this slide actually nearly completely uh, inhibited the growth of the bacterium at that concentration. And among those six compounds, three of them were ones where I could identify that chemotype, that class of compounds in the training data. So maybe that's not so surprising. But actually, three of the ones indicated here were new chemotypes for activity against MTB. So that was, the, I would say, it was quite a successful demonstration. Uh, and then we also went on to do this for gram-positive organism, for B. subtilis. Training data here was 151 active compounds and 756 inactive compounds. Representation shown here, you can just tell it's great diversity of chemistry. Again, representing many mechanisms. It's not just a single mechanism. Training models, again, were 800 of them. Uh, here, the, we were able to buy 45 compounds from the top scoring compounds, and they were tested against the you know, standard ATCC strain. And 12 of the 45 uh, had measurable activity, so an MIC value of less than 100 or 128. Uh, and th six of them you know, showed somewhat more potent activity with MIC values less than 30 micrograms per mil. You know, certainly there are beta-lactams among here and a fluoroquinolone, those were known. Okay, but again, there are three of these six were actually chemotypes that were not represented in the training data, but yet this meta-model built on top of this 800, set of 800 basis set models actually contained en enough information in it that in fact, okay, let's, these new compounds actually are likely to have activity against B. subtilis or against mycobacterium tuberculosis. And then I want to finish then with a very important piece here. The question is, well, maybe those models are all models of bacterial targets, okay? But in fact, it turns out that none of those 800 models have anything to do with microorganisms. These are all predictive models based on binding to and modulation of mammalian targets, receptors, ion channels, enzymes, okay? And what that proves is in fact that in fact this can be a useful basis set across which to characterize compounds that captures the way small molecules interact with typically protein targets, and it's that can be then applied, and a good algorithm can extract from that a signal that's relevant even to a protein in an organism that doesn't exist in that training set. Okay, and this goes back to the point I made earlier that, you know, current machine learning approaches and AI approaches, their whole goal is to be predictive in generating a prediction of value. They're not trying to be explanatory. So in this case, we weren't even trying to explain why these compounds might be antibacterial. We're just trying to predict new classes of compounds that might be interesting for further study. Uh, and with that, then, I would like to, to, to thank my colleagues at, at Numerit uh, and to thank you for your attention uh, for our talks this morning. And now I think uh, Andrea and Heinz and I are, are happy to address any questions that you might have. <laughs>